Buenas tardes. Good evening. Soy Ignacio Morro. My name is Ignacio Morro. I'm the general director of the UN and human rights at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and I'm speaking on behalf of the director of Casa Arabe, who couldn't make it here this evening, unfortunately. Thank you very much for being here with us today. We're here to celebrate an international day of human rights. Uh, every December 10th, we celebrate the Universal Declaration's anniversary and the ministry organizes events such as these to promote dialogue and exchange of opinions with experts. Adela Diaz will be introducing tonight's speakers. She's uh, the uh, director of the Human Rights Office at the ministry, but we've invited ambassadors who are very familiar with the Human Rights Council and the issues related to Human Council. So Adela will be asking the speakers, including myself, a series of questions. And after that, if uh, we have time, the audience will be given a chance to ask questions. Please speak slowly, just like I'm trying to do, to make it easier for interpreters to do their job. After uh, this uh, seminar, we can enjoy a glass of wine and we can exchange opinions and uh, talk about this topic, which is a sensitive topic, which has a great political importance. We see it on the news every day, and governments pay very close attention to these issues, and that includes the Spanish government. Let me now give the floor to Adela. She's going to be facilitating uh, this roundtable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Director. We're going to have a roundtable here today around the issue Human Rights Council challenges and stock taking. We've set the goal of uh, bringing the Council of Human Rights, uh, which is in Geneva, bringing it here to Madrid. We want to reflect on the Human Rights Council and, above all, we want to know what the experience of other members of the Human Rights Council is, what the experience of uh, civil society is in this area. And so we've organized this event with a selfish perspective because we're new members at the Human Rights Council. And I'm sure that we're, what we're going to hear here today will be very helpful as members of the Council of Human Rights once our new term begins on January 1st. We've asked speakers today to talk about the Council. And we've prepared a set of questions for the speakers. And we would like our guests tonight to share those ideas and those comments among themselves and with you. Let me introduce the speakers we have with us here this evening. We have with us Shalva Sikarashvili. He's uh, the 
ambassador, permanent representative from Georgia to the Human Rights Office in Geneva. Since uh, June 2012, he's had that position. And this year, he has been the vice chair of the Human Rights Council. So he has the perspective not only of a member of the council, but he also has the perspective of the bureau of that council. And before the, that appointment, Ambassador Tsikarasvili was permanent representative to the UN in New York since uh, 2009. He'd already been in New York since 2005. He's a diplomat, career diplomat. He joined the Georgian Foreign Affairs Ministry in 1998. And he worked at the legal and international department until 2004. And from 2004 and 2009, he was deputy director of uh, the international organizations department. Welcome. We also have with us Walid Dudesh. He's uh, the permanent representative of Tunisia to the uh, UN office in Geneva. Ambassador Dudesh he's a, is also a career diplomat. He started his career in 1989. And he's been posted at the permanent representation to the UN in New York for his country and to the African Union. He's been ambassador to Sudan between uh, 2011 and 2015. And he's also worked at the Foreign Affairs Ministry in Tunisia, where he's held the position of uh, chief of staff of the minister and head of the legal department. And he's also been a professor at the Diplomatic Institute. Thank you very much for being here this evening, Ambassador. And at the very end of the table, we have Esteban Beltran. He's the director of uh, the Spanish section of Amnesty International. He's held that position for 20 years. In the Spanish chapter of Amnesty, which has over 85,000 members. He's also a human rights and development professor at six uh, different Spanish and Latin American universities. He's researched human rights violations in Central America. He's uh, been the, uh, he's also had a position at the, at Amnesty International. And um, he's been involved in different research missions and he's lived in different countries such as the UK, Argentina, and Ecuador. Thank you, uh, Mr. Beltran, for being here this evening. And here next to me, I have Juan Ignacio Morro Villacian, who's our UN General Director and Human Rights Director. He's a career diplomat and he's uh, held positions in Spanish embassies to Seoul, Moscow, Beijing, and he's also been at the Spanish consulate in Geneva and at the permanent representation, Spanish permanent, UN permanent representation in New York. He's had different positions. He's been head of, uh, no, chief of staff of the undersecretary. And since um, November 2017, he's the general director for uh, UN for the UN and human rights. Thank you for being here this evening. Hechas las presentaciones, vamos a iniciar esta. After these introductions, we're going to ask our guests a set of questions. Please speak slowly so that interpreters can do their job. And if possible, speakers, please limit your answers to each of these questions to five minutes so that we can close as scheduled. 
My first question is for all the speakers here. We have to look back and remember that the Human Rights Council was set up in 2006. Last year, we celebrated its 10th anniversary. And the question is a very broad question. What, in your opinion, are the achievements that the Human Rights Council has made in these uh, more than 10 years of existence. I'd like to ask Ambassador Siskarazvili to be the first one to answer the question, please. You have the floor. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, first of all, very good evening uh, to all of you, and I'm really honored and grateful to be here. Thank you very much for this nice invitation and fantastic opportunity to speak before you. Uh, I think this is uh, an important initiative uh, taking into consideration that sometimes in Geneva we argue on the lack of open uh, discussions and open avenues of the discussion. So I am really grateful for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation of Spain for providing this avenue of uh, uh, open discussion uh, to us. And also, obviously, to mark the important day of the human rights and join uh, the universal campaign on, on that by uh, having this discussion today. I would also like to use this opportunity to congratulate Spain with the election and joining the Council. Uh, and um, uh, obviously uh, wishing you um, uh, big success in the, in the years to come. And the years probably will be very dynamic and uh, uh, difficult. Uh, <clears throat> so on, on, uh, on the topic, uh, uh, Madam Diaz uh, raised, I think it's indeed it's a broad one, what, what the Council did achieve throughout the past years. And I think uh, more than 11 years have passed since the establishment of the Council, which actually, mm, uh, um, it's a quite a long period to, 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 uh, to conclude what does work and what doesn't actually. Uh, and I think um, uh, on, on this very topic, the discussions are on throughout, uh, uh, throughout the month and period. It's an endless discussion in Geneva. But I think um, uh, what is fundamental to notice is that uh, Human Rights Council established itself as a very strong uh, organization which tackles uh, the human rights issues, human rights uh, Prob problems uh, globally. Obviously, it, it is not. It may not uh, 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 be a, 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 an ideal uh, structure, an ideal institution. It may have some shortcomings and problems. But this is the organisation which is dealing with the matters of the Human Rights Council abuses and gross violations that no other UN body is supposed to. Uh, tackle and will not go to uh, tackle these uh, these problems. So uh, I think this is a very uh, critical point. Obviously, um, uh, um, another another highlight, if I may, uh, to say so that uh, indeed we have a good mechanism. Indeed, we have a good sub mechanisms within within the structure, which actually helps us. Uh, to promote, uh, to promote human rights uh, worldwide. I think uh, uh, in this context, I have to highlight three, uh, three um, principal areas which I think without doubt is, uh, is, a, uh, is a success story of the Council. Uh, first, that is the universal periodic review. This is uh, a mechanism which works within the Human Rights Council and examines, uh, shall I, uh, and examines every country, uh, examines the records of uh, human rights records of every country, 
uh, in the period of four and a half years, five, uh, five years. And that is very, very critical, uh, critical uh, uh, component of the Council. Um, uh, you have uh, countries freely up, uh, coming and enjoying the scrutiny of the uh, intergovernmental body by accepting the recommendations and then working, taking that, those recommendations back home and uh, implementing, implementing them, thus trying to advance their own national human rights agenda on the ground. It has been a universal process. All countries are involved there, and it's a peer process, and sometimes it is referred to as a jewel, uh, uh, crown jewel of the, uh, of the, uh, of the mechanisms. Of the mechanisms. Obviously, um, there are some elements which probably need to be um, paid a little bit more attention in the years to come when it comes to universal periodic review. First uh, thing is that we've concluded two cycles of the universal periodic review, meaning that each country twice have uh, uh, examined that, uh, uh, have been uh, examined through this mechanism. So we are already in the third cycle, and I think in this uh, period, special attention needs to be paid to the implementation of the accepted recommendations, because there is a lot of recommendations coming from the countries taken by uh, the country uh, concerned back to the capital. So now it's time really to implement. So, and the focus of the countries need to be uh, laid down on that, uh, that particular issue. Some countries did establish their own national mechanisms how to follow up on the accepted recommendations. So that is very important uh, also um, uh, mechanism, and it involves uh, all actors on the ground, whether it's a government, parliament, donors, international organizations, civil society representatives. So all are in, in the process of following up to the implement and monitoring of the implementation of the recommendations. Also in the context of the universal periodic review, I think the role of the parliaments need to be uh, mentioned. Uh, because uh, in, in, the, in the UPR, many countries did receive recommendations related to the ratification of certain international uh, conventions. So parliament is eventually involved in the process. But de facto situation is that in some cases there is really a lack of uh, um, engagement uh, from the parliament that I think that is needed uh, in the future to be promoted. <laughs> the second very important uh, mechanism uh, within the human rights uh, machinery is the the institution of the special procedures mandate holders, which I think also is a, uh, is a success story of the, of the Council. At this point, we have dozens of thematic and country-specific sp uh, special procedures mandate holders. That is the institution which is coming up, an individual or group of individuals who are coming up with the specific recommendations. They are paying visits to uh, specific countries, so they are engaged in the open discussion with the, uh, with the countries on, on some shortcomings. So that is an international eye of uh, the international community uh, on the ground. So throughout the year, we have hundreds of uh, reports of the special procedures, uh, but sometimes that is also um, observed that due to the lack of time, sometimes a real engagement with the speci special procedures mandate holders is lacking in the council. So we call this engagement interactive dialogue, but sometimes we face the reality that th this is neither interactive nor dialogue. But this is a different problem which I'm going to address in the in, in other segment of our discussion. And maybe the last and very important um, uh, element, which is, I think, uh, uh, an achievement of the Council. Uh, <clears throat> this is the engagement of the civil society actors in the work of the Human Rights Council, and that is very critical. Uh, after the reform of its uh, predecessor body, the Commission, uh, 
So the, uh, at this, uh, in this new environment, we really enjoy the, uh, the full uh, engagement of the civil society, not only in the council within its mechanism, but on the ground as well. So, but uh, there's also a, a problem sometimes which we face. I, I myself being in the bureau, we faced a couple of times this year very negative cases when some representatives of the civil society rep uh, so uh, organizations or human rights defenders were uh, prevented uh, uh, from visiting Geneva, attending human rights council. So, and the role of the human rights council and the bureau itself is really critical in safeguarding this um, framework of uh, uh, safeguarding, protecting, and further enriching this environment of the civil society's engagement within the Human Rights Council. But uh, I think uh, no one, uh, actually every single country did benefit from, from that and all inclusiveness uh, and, the, and, the, and, and the idea of uh, having all voices be heard need, need to be preserved and thus the space for the civil society and the human rights defenders must be in the future also uh, uh, safeguarded for the, for the benefit of the uh, local population on the ground. So that is maybe uh, the, the some of the elements I wanted to highlight and sorry if I went beyond of, uh, um, uh, of uh, regulated five minutes. Muchas gracias, embajador, por esas, por esas reflexiones. Thank you. Thank you very much, eh, al, al mismo tiempo, muy didácticas, yo creo, y, y muy útiles para todos nosotros. Ahora querría pedirle al embajador Dudesh también que compartiera con nosotros sus eh, reflexiones sobre los logros de la Comisión desde su inception. شكرا مساء الخير للجميع انا حقيقه سعيد جدا بوجودي معكم في هذه المناسبه on this occasion, not only to speak about human rights but also for uh, this uh, celebration of uh, the uh, day of human rights and thank you very much um, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Spain for inviting me here. And this is part of the preparation of uh, Spain to become a full-fledged member of uh, this Human Rights Council. I think that Spain fully deserves it, and I know that Spain will uh, make uh, significant contributions to, to the Council. And uh, as the permanent representative of Tunisia in the Council, I think that Spanish uh, participation is going to be very positive for the Council. Thank you very much then to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for uh, their initiative. And uh, I, I'd really like to congratulate you all for the importance uh, given to this event. I think that uh, uh, we will be uh, able to listen to your questions later on and uh, also hear your comments about how the Council of Human Rights should be. I think that um, your question, the question you've just uh, asked me, uh, Mrs. Uh, Diaz, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, about the achievements of the Human Rights Council since its inception in 2006. It's uh, over 10 years now. That was uh, uh, a very important momentum because the uh, uh, UN family as a whole gave uh, greater importance to human rights at the time um, and uh, because uh, instead of uh, being a mere commission, it became a council, and uh, its mission has been to protect and advocate for human rights all over the world ever since. 
So let's take a look at uh, uh, the role of the Council. It's resolution number 60 of the General Assembly. This is the criteria that uh, all member states need to follow when we need to discuss any issues that fall into the remit of the Human Rights Council. This resolution, resolution number 60, is the rule that we need to abide by. And also, uh, the resolution that uh, sets out the uh, strengths and the weaknesses um, of uh, the uh, work carried out in each country. According to Resolution 6251, our tasks are the following. We need to promote the respect of uh, human rights for all with uh, no kind of, uh, no type of discrimination for everyone with uh, e equality, fairness, and justice. Second, we need to treat and deal with all our cases, our violations of human rights, and to discuss the recommendations linked to those cases, as well as uh, promoting coordination, because it's uh, uh, of the utmost importance when uh, evaluating and assessing the work carried out by the Council. We also need to disseminate uh, these reports um, using the mechanisms, the existing mechanisms in the UN. We also need to take into account all the international principles applicable and uh, we need to be impartial and objective. We cannot be selective and we need to uh, create a dialogue and uh, cooperation on an international level. All these elements need to be respected overall by the Council so it can fulfill its role in the best possible manner. Now, you ask your question, and it's uh, been over 10 years since, since uh, our creation. So to what extent has the Council been able to to uh, fulfill its role? Well, we, we could say, and there are several ways to look at it, and there are contradicting views on this, well, it's uh, like uh, a glass, um, you know, can be either half full or half empty. Um, you can say that whatever we've done at the Council is never enough. There's always too many things that have not been done. Others see it the other way around. They see uh, a very effective job carried out by us. So everybody is right at the end of the day. But I'd also um, like to tell you my own views, um, which is uh, uh, related to whether the, the glass was actually half full, half empty, or in what cases it was three quarters full or three quarters empty. So which are the tasks that we have been uh, performing better and worse. I work in Geneva, and uh, I'm, I, I'm overseeing uh, several uh, committees and bodies in Geneva. You know that in Geneva there are several international organizations specialized organizations and very many different committees and bodies 
And the Human Rights Council has a, a, a very uh, significant profile. It is one of the, the, uh, the, the bodies with the highest profile. And that's also, that's also the, one of the, the fora where uh, there are ma more um, claims uh, submitted to it, more um, differences, uh, uh, different views, and, uh, and uh, many uh, and um, many um, different uh, particip participants there with their own um, particular uh, ideas. So there is uh, quite a lot of uh, debate and discussion. Uh, it's not um, just a, 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 an empty uh, committee where nothing ever happens no it is a very uh, it is very much alive and uh, we're passionate uh, debates and discussions emerge. At first, when uh, it was created, it was difficult to see which was the best way to to uh, give uh, this uh, body an international projection. Uh, there were many different uh, debates and discussions to see what would be the best way to channel um, human rights um, issues through the public. We were all, uh, we only agreed in, in just one thing, we needed to, to clearly support human rights and uh, act against any uh, violations of human rights. So what would we do with vis-a-vis the, vis -vis the media? Well, we decided to sign a convention, a convention that should be signed by all states who wanted to abide by this principle of uh, promoting human rights. There's uh, another element, uh, which is the fight against terrorism. There is a major debate now on how to face uh, the uh, uh, issue of terrorism, because terrorism is indeed uh, a violation, a human rights violation. There's been it's been many years since we have been uh, discussing how to respect human rights, the human rights of those who have not respected human rights themselves. That is, terrorists. And we have all uh, agreed on one thing: we need to respect human rights, the human rights of everyone, even human rights of people who have not respected them. So there, there, there's a need, there's, uh, we need to reach a balance, to strike a balance between uh, um, fighting against terror and respecting human rights. And that's a clear example of how we work at the Council and how we discuss the different issues at hand. Well, I don't know if I have uh, more time to, to uh, explain how we work. These are some of the, uh, just some brushstrokes about what we do. Shortcomings, of course, are certain short shortcomings, um, dangerous sometimes, even. The uh, UN resolution says that the Council needs to uh, work without uh, ever using double standards and the uh, resolutions uh, issued that issue from the council cannot be uh, politicized we cannot uh, be selective and pick and choose and uh, uh, only treat or deal with uh, human rights issues that are related to certain uh, sites. This could uh, be threatening. I mean, if we did that, that could uh, uh, jeopardize the whole uh, institution. The inst if the council itself was created, was uh, precisely to that effect, to 
um, try and uh, prevent politicization and political divides. In the Council, that was precisely one of the, the issues that we uh, had to face. They are still a challenge for the Council. We'll see um, what happens in the future, but this is one of the major hurdles that we've had to overcome. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador, for um, also leading us uh, to our second question, actually. But before moving on to that, uh, I would like to hear the views of uh, civil society about the achievements of the Human Rights Council. And um, so, Esteban Beltran, you now have the floor. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having invited uh, Amnesty International to take part in this discussion in times where certain governments and certain stakeholders are uh, uh, questioning the, the usefulness itself of, uh, of the Human Rights Council. It's uh, very, uh, it's, uh, it's essential that we hold such discussions. They are very welcome. Um, I'd like to focus on an achievement and uh, I'd like to, to use uh, Mr. Tudesh, uh, Ambassador Tudesh, uh, uh, words and, and refer to, to the full glass, the half full glass. I'll, I'll leave the half empty glass for later, if there's time. Amnesty International took part in uh, the committee's work uh, for many years, and then when it uh, became a council, we're still, we're still very active. There's been many major achievements um, ever since. First, I think that uh, the first major achievement is the fact that virtually all member states are subject to or examination or, or this universal review, peer review. Uh, this periodic review, uh, these intermediate reviews are very useful. These are, by using, they, they are being the fact that uh, they, they let themselves be scrutinized has a value, is, is very valuable in itself. And, you know, even more so uh, at present in the current situation. Both ambassadors spoke about special procedures. Special procedures have grown in importance and influence in the last few years. And, uh, they have not been restricted or uh, in the last uh, few years either, other, uh, just uh, rather the other way around. They have increased in number and depth. There are new mandates about new rights, for instance, the right to privacy or the strengthening of uh, the, the fight against uh, um, gender discrimination. We have made progress in several other principles, such as business and human rights. And Spain, for instance, has been very active uh, for many years in promoting many uh, rights, such as the right to water and to health care. So um, the, the Council has been able to adapt to new uh, human rights and new advances and, and progresses made in this field. Uh, there's uh, one uh, particular issue where the Council has made lots of progress. It has to do with uh, urgency, uh, urgent situations like, uh, for instance, the cri urgent crisis such as the Myanmar uh, human rights situation and some accountability um, issues, such as uh, ones related to Syria and South Sudan. These have been also important milestones. There's been also uh, another uh, important element that's uh, been strengthened uh, lately, which are the coordination mechanisms. Um, three new uh, mechanisms have been created of late. Uh, related to very serious uh, uh, violations of human rights, 
for instance, mission to Myanmar during the March session, the inquiry on violence in the Karzai region, uh, or, uh, for instance, the the uh, expert group on uh, violations in Yemen. These are uh, very uh, significant because one of the elements that was uh, missing uh, was the, the ability to, to give uh, urgent uh, responses, responses to emergencies and uh, other uh, coordination mechanisms at the Commission. And uh, let me finish with some other elements about this uh, half ball class. There is a, a very a significant initiative that's uh, been uh, uh, promoted by the Netherlands about when government should be members of the council and be um, uh, participating in the council. I think this is this is uh, an important issue. We will discuss this later when we speak about the half-empty glass. And as uh, Ambassador Tiskarsvili said about retaliations against um, human rights advocates, there's one resolution. Uh, the resolution says that uh, the, the, there needs to be a dialogue with the um, general, uh, sec general, general secretary about this issue. For instance, if there are retaliations, uh, uh, there should be something done to protect these advocates. Well, this is a major initiative by the council. It's been 10 years, and uh, the system has been reinforced with the creation of the council. There's still a lot left to do, but this we'll speak about later. Well, thank you very much, Esteban, and thank you for um, uh, respecting the, the time that was allocated to you. And thank you also for, for your um, comments. I think that there are uh, many elements in common between the views of uh, member states and the views of the civil society. And uh, finally, I'll give the floor to our director so he can also speak about uh, the achievements made by the council. Well, thank you very much, Adela. I think that, well, as I am speaking last, several ideas have already been mentioned, but you know, human rights, this, uh, it's, it's an endless uh, subject. So many other things come to mind. I, I fully agree with uh, the views expressed by the three um, experts uh, uh, that have, uh, that are here with me. And, uh, well, using the same terms as uh, Ambassador Dudesh, I, uh, there's no question, I see the glass as half full. But it is a very political glass. It is a glass filled with rights where progress is difficult to make. But uh, we've made a significant progress in the last few years in spite of all of that. And this, this is very much related to the, the situation on the spot, real, the situation real sense, and, and apologize because I have a sore throat today. Well, I, I was I used to be ambassador in Geneva, and that was uh, around uh, 2002, 2003. In Geneva, everybody speaks about human rights. I mean, uh, the in diplomatic circles, and uh, uh, we were it was a. Uh, uh, enormous frustration with uh, with the committee at the time, with the commission at the time, um, uh, the commission's role at the time. We, we thought that the, the, the commission was uh, pretty much useless for its purpose. And I was lucky that since 2005, I was posted into New York. And in the summer summit, uh, the decision was reached to create a council and it was created the following year, in 2006. I would say, and this could be quite controversial, but if I, if I had to sum things up in a nutshell, I'd say that uh, there's been huge progress made because that now we have a, a true, a genuine culture to respect human rights. rights. Um, very few years ago, countries that were violating human rights i'm not saying that they would boast about it but they but you know for political reasons they they felt justified um, in their actions 
You will agree with me that, unfortunately, there are still many uh, violations of human rights still. But when countries do that, they they you know, uh, they are on the defensive. They they uh, they are outside the historical trends. We've made a lot of progress. Uh, the charter, the human, the the. the UN Charter, which is a glorious tool, uh, has 19 chapters, and none of them is devoted to human rights. In the preambular part, the, uh, it's uh, individual rights. Um, in Chapter 1, uh, the purpose of individual rights, but there is no uh, the, uh, no system that creates, uh, there is no, nowhere where that creates a system for the protection of human rights, but they are there. And they, and for many years, they have now become the third major pillar of the United Nations, together with uh, peacekeeping and uh, development cooperation. We've made a lot of progress. And, and and let me mention um, other things so the, the the audience can can hear about other things as well. We've made a lot of progress. We have the uh, Universal Declaration. We have uh, the Compact. We have um, agreements and conventions, and that's only from the legal standpoint. And uh, luckily, we have uh, more initiatives, more and more increasingly num increasing number of initiatives, and the, the recognition, effective recognition, not only theoretical recognition of new rights. That's only, as I said, from the legal standpoint. But besides, and beyond that, the Human Rights Council has. Uh, allowed us to strengthen the institutional element in all of this, the creation, uh, uh, the, 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 the commission uh, became a council, and that was a major leap forward. Uh, the uh, commissioner's office has also uh, um, done uh, major work, and, and that um, we also have these special procedures and we have treaties. So we've made uh, a lot of progress. When uh, the Council was created in 2006, a major step forward was taken. In the preambular part, the, uh, the differences, major differences between uh, member states need to be taken into account from the political, cultural, religious, historical point of view. But in spite of that, all of them are need to respect and protect human rights. Many uh, achievements have been made. We've mentioned the peer review, this uh, uh, periodic uh, peer review, universal peer review. Then uh, it's been said that uh, uh, council member states need to have a certain uh, certain career, so to speak, or certain uh, history of protecting human rights, um, certain track record. Uh, their, their rights could be suspended if they violated uh, human rights. Um, claims can be made, uh, resolutions against them can be taken. Uh, uh, there's a need to involve civil society, and that has a much greater, a much better role here than it ever had in the past. Uh, journalists and the media need to be protected. So uh, there's no question the, the glass is half full, but it is very hard to fill it. And uh, the other half uh, will it be very, very hard to fill. But there's no question that the uh, progress made in the last few years has been um, uh, enormous, have been huge. And uh, the contributions of the Council have uh, played a, a major part there. But I think that overall, progress made in the last few years have been satisfactory, although nobody can ever be happy uh, with the pr level of protection of human rights. Well, it's, if, if there's one, just one person suffering, there's still a lot to do. But our international community is very complex. We have uh, uh, over 150 members. We have different uh, political views. In, uh, uh, and if we don't do this together, well, things will be increasingly difficult. But we will come to that later on. Well, thank you very much, Director, for 
uh, complementing uh, with your ideas this first round on the achievements made by the uh, Human Rights Council. So let's move on to the second question. And now we will uh, be using uh, Ambassador Desch's uh, terms uh, for us. I mean, we will take them and we'll, so we will now move on to the half empty glass. Have empty glass, but if we want to say it in politically correct terms, that are, that is, they are called challenges. So now we've looked at the past. Now we will be looking towards the future. So uh, from the people, from the different panelists, I would like to hear what they consider um, the, the most important challenges that the Council will have to face in the next few years. And uh, I'd like to begin by giving the floor to uh, Ambassador Siskarashvili to uh, uh, let us to share his comments without, with us. And please, please try to respect the time limits so we would be able to wrap up at the time uh, that we had planned. And please do not consider this uh, is, uh, uh, as a constraint uh, uh, by the facilitator, because I want you to speak less about the half-empty glass. It's just a logistics question. Thank you very much. I try to be very uh, concrete so <clears throat> and straight to the point. Uh, regarding the, uh, the, the, the upcoming challenges. So if you look uh, to the agenda of the, there are several, but um, let's start from the beginning. So if you look at the Human Rights Council agenda, so it's really heavy, it's overloaded. So there's basically um, too many issues, too many panels, too many discussions, too many resolutions. There sometimes we feel that there's, there's no dialogue at all. So when you give to the speaker a minute and a half, so it's simply there's no space for the genuine dialogue. And that's what we are lacking there in the council, in the council which is created for that, to have dialogue. Uh, I think that needs to be somehow enriched via informal uh, possibilities of having dialogue. Uh, or uh, So in reaching dialogue in the room 20 and beyond, that is very much uh, uh, important to have because practically there would be no time for the, for the real discussions, for the council's attention to the implementation, what has been, whatever has been uh, adopted by the council itself. And sometimes we agree that uh, in that context, that is a positive thing that the council is tackling so many issues, but at the same time it has its negative complications. So sometimes we agree that council has become a, a victim of its own success. And that's, I think, a, 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 true, a true story. So in, in the years to come, I think a um, very important element to f uh, which <coughs> needs to be focused and reach is the prevention component of the, of the council. So, an early, early warning elements uh, uh, of the council, which is there, which we sometimes use, sometimes it is not uh, fully used, but that is need definitely to be uh, to be enriched that that particular tool. And the secretary general did mention this is the subject of uh, of the uh, uh, of the council to look at the prevention mandate and to use these prevention tools effectively as effectively as possible in order to avoid. Few further deteriorations of the situation. And in this context, I think every single component we outlined here has its own role, whether that is UPR, special procedures mandate holders, High Commissioner for Human Rights, the Council itself, civil society on the ground, and including Bureau as well. So uh, uh, I think Geneva needs to be somehow more proactive in, for example, dispatching some teams on the ground to, to talk with the local government, local actors, in order to uh, avoid further deteriorations uh, uh, on the ground. So we, uh, in, in, in past years, we did discuss a lot about the improvement of the effectiveness uh, and efficiency of the, uh, of the council. That is going to be uh, uh, in the pipeline next year as well. Uh, 
so uh, how to improve the effectiveness, how to improve its working methods. And I think one of the particular uh, subject has been raised by uh, a distinguished representative from Amnesty International that is related to, not directly to working methods, but to membership criteria, which is also being, uh, being discussed widely uh, already in, uh, informally in the uh, in Geneva, and there's a number of, uh, number of ideas how to better have competitive environment uh, for the Human Rights Council uh, elections. So uh, the, the process which is related to the improvement of uh, the working method and the, in order to increase the effectiveness uh, of the Council is still on, and that is going to be during the membership of, of Spain, uh, Spain as well. It's a long process, certainly. Uh, it's a human rights council, it's an intergovernmental body where all countries are represented, all has its own particular interest, and obviously when it comes to certain improvements, we need a, a joint, a consensus step towards that. So, uh, and I think even though this year probably may not produce that necessary consensus on some element, but I think every year is a step forward towards that. And in 2021, when the when the, uh, when the uh, overwhelming discussion on that subject is expected on, on possible in reaching certain criteria of the Human Rights Council by reforming it, I think we'll be ready by that moment to somehow to make a solid step forward to a bit improve uh, the efficiency and effectiveness of the, of the Council. Very technical issue, but is also related to Spain's uh, membership uh, to the Council that is related to time management, which we are again lacking uh, there in the Council, uh, and that is an issue which needs an immediate solution uh, from January 1st in order to, to save the, the unhindered run of the Council session uh, in September 2012. Uh, the, uh, another maybe area where uh, still uh, it's a challenging one, but it was still n there is a room for improvement. It's a, it's a, it's so-called the coordination between Geneva and New York. So sometimes there is no basically interaction. There is an interaction, obviously, but I would wish to have it more in a regular basis and that is mostly related to the Council and the General Assembly itself. Uh, we had in the past some practices when the Third Committee uh, had an attempt to, uh, to open the issue which has been dealt by the Council, so uh, a, a really, really strong steps need to be uh, conducted in order to solidify this, uh, this coordination in the, in the years uh, to come. Uh, so um, uh, the, 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 the element of the working uh, workload, actually, we, as I've mentioned, there's, uh, this year I believe there were uh, around, uh, up to 150 resolutions, 144 if I'm not mistaken. But uh, obviously it's always hard to monitor the implementation process. So that is a very fundamental issue, I think, of the Council to to really uh, enrich its uh, uh, capabilities of monitoring the situation on the, uh, on the better of better monitoring of the situation on the ground. Because sometimes we face that there is a lack of cooperation on the ground, lack of certain states to cooperate with its own mechanisms. So in that case, we need further steps, further uh, actions from the councils, further recommendations in order to help that country really to meet the um, uh, meet its own obligations vis-à-vis uh, -vis, uh, human rights. Uh, I did all, uh, raise that issue during my first intervention, and, but I really want to raise it again because one case came to my mind uh, regarding reprisal. So this year we had, uh, uh, I just noticed that I, may, I might have been very fast in, uh, is it okay for the, um, sorry about that. Uh, um, regarding reprisals, so this year we faced, the Bureau faced the situation when a, a direct threat was coming from, from, a, st from a head of a state uh, of one country, so which is clearly an acceptable issue. So, but this is, uh, this is a challenge which may uh, be occurring in the future, and I'm not obviously excluding that. And in this context, Human Rights Council need to be very very strong on that. 
maybe very last uh, moment that is related again to the dialogue. I'm always trying to highlight that element because um, that is really something we miss in Geneva. So, uh, and I think the, the, uh, the avenues like this is a good example of how can we informally discuss and really uh, try to identify problems, try to find uh, a recipes and solutions. It's a good, good tool and I hope that Spain's uh, initiative here would be further, uh, uh, further be uh, uh, continued uh, there in the in, in the council because uh, in different forests uh, of the UN, there's other formats where member states are getting together informally, even sometimes with no agenda, no no formal records, and that helps to 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 have in-depth debate on the issues. And I think this is. Uh, also something, maybe not a challenging one, but it's an issue which needs to be uh, tackled in the future. Um, maybe at this point this is all I wanted to raise. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, le damos entonces ahora la, la palabra al embajador. Let me give the floor to Ambassador Dudesh to hear what he has to say about the challenges facing the Council in the future. The first challenge is that the Council of Human Rights is made up of countries that are very culturally diverse. And this involves a great challenge because each country will always act based on that cultural background. Another challenge is the different speeds at which members uh, move. We have uh, developed countries, developing countries, and so on. And this often leads to confrontation. And uh, this means that we have to accept and acknowledge diversity. As I said, sometimes there are confrontations Sometimes there are conflicts between developing countries and developed countries. But we need to strike a balance between political and cultural rights on the one hand and social rights on the other hand because we often see a lack of respect for social, economic, and political rights. We know that political and cultural rights are indispensable in order to guarantee economic and social rights, and vice versa, because uh, cultural and economic and, uh, rights also ensure that civil and political rights can be enforced. So to me, this is a challenge faced by the Council. It was like that in the past, it continues to be that way, and the Council will continue to face those challenges in the future. Another challenge is uh, politicization. We can't ignore the fact that each country has its own ideology, approaches, culture, and so on, but this should not prevail over human rights, whether they be civil and political, or social, or economic, or cultural. And here maybe we can raise the question, how can this be resolved? Well, 
Tunisia. Favors dialogue in the council. Because cultural religion and religious problems can only be resolved through dialogue. And that's why I said that res Resolution 6251 is a resolution that stresses the need for dialogue. This dialogue should take place on an equal footing between uh, wealthy countries and poor or developing countries. So that even when it comes to civil and political rights, human rights issues are resolved, for instance, in order to guarantee the elimination of torture. This requires training, awareness raising, in order to change mindsets. All of this requires resources, and therefore, all of this will have to be taken into account, and uh, we will have to promote cooperation. That doesn't mean we're going to ignore violations, human, human rights violations, but we must work with countries willing to cooperate, willing to listen to criticism, to recommendations, and therefore, we need to work with those countries in order to strengthen their mechanisms and their institutions. And if a country rejects any sort of uh, assistance, well, that would be a problem. But as long as a country shows it is willing to cooperate, then we have to welcome that. And we've seen this in Africa, in Burundi, for instance, last year. Burundi was totally unwilling to cooperate with investigative commissions or committees. And the council said, okay, well, we will stop providing assistance. And this year, Burundi, out of its own initiative, has said, well, I want to cooperate with you because I find myself in a very complicated situation. So we've asked uh, the African group what kind of assistance we could provide. And uh, it was suggested that we cooperate with the High Commissioner, and that's what we're doing. So I think, to sum up, that dialogue and cooperation and coordination are key elements to uh, resolve these challenges. And unfortunately, uh, this, these um, elements aren't strong enough yet. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Embajador. Thank you, Ambassador. Let us now hear from Esteban Beltran. He'll be talking about the challenges uh, facing the Council. Thanks again. We believe there are four major challenges. First, there has been progress on uh, the situation of different countries. However, it's a fact that some countries haven't been closely reviewed. For instance, the repression to journalists in Turkey, for instance, the chair of Amnesty International, who's still in prison, and that hasn't 
been looked at by council by the council. This is important. So some countries aren't being closely enough uh, scrutinized. The council hasn't paid attention to the human rights situation in Egypt, which has deteriorated. There are some countries that haven't been as closely watched uh, as uh, they should have given the seriousness of the human rights situation there. And this is uh, important and it relates to what Ambassador Dudek was saying about uh, polit politization. We're talking about uh, political and civil rights and of course also economic um, uh, social and cultural rights as well. Where there are serious uh, human rights um, abuses, well, all those countries should be uh, closely looked at by the Council. Ambassador uh, Sikrashvili was talking about reprisals, and it's not exceptional. Since we can mention countries, let's mention them. The Philippines, for instance. Uh, the president of the Philippines talks about hitting one of the council representatives, and that's unacceptable. Ethiopia. Burundi, although there are positive notes there, but um, there, has, uh, there, there have been measures against representatives in Bahrain. So all these reprisals against representatives um, from the council should be condemned, fully condemned by the governments, the countries sitting on the council. Reprisals are unacceptable for special representatives and uh, for human rights defenders. And this is another uh, of the top challenges. Another major challenge which would uh, think we're moving towards the past has to do with the reform of the Council. There are two major concerns there. When we used to talk about reforming the Council, there were governments that said that country issues shouldn't be discussed that country issues shouldn't be discussed unless the country being reviewed accepts it, unless there's a supermajority of the members sitting on council. But no, this is uh, something which is very important, and we've said this today. Countries should be reviewed. And that should be part of the reform of the council if that reform is implemented. So country review, country scrutiny should be something that the council takes on. And this is uh, something which would involve great progress. Civil society should be involved. We would like governments and the council when the reform is introduced to talk to NGOs and to promote dialogue with civil society organizations. We hope that the reform, if it is undertaken, shouldn't see uh, NGOs as uh, an obstacle, but rather something that bolsters the Council and something which is necessary to the work of the Council. So the Council, and we should remember this, is uh, there to protect people from human rights violations by states, and civil society should be involved. Si se restringe la participación de los defensores de derechos humanos en el trabajo del Consejo. Finalmente, también se ha mencionado aquí cómo hacemos que los gobiernos que se someten, eh, no diría gustosamente, pero se someten al examen periódico universal, eh, implementan. Esto es importante. Entonces. Uh, uh, how can we uh, let them uh, uh, be part of these uh, measures? Well, 
in the uh, working groups. There should be uh, a ratio of uh, the implementation of these uh, uh, recommendations to see, uh, so we can measure, actually measure uh, to what extent these recommendations are being implemented or not. The, these are the four challenges that we believe the, the Council has ahead of in their work as well. Thank you, Esteban. We were trying to solve a uh, uh, small uh, technical issue that it's been uh, finally resolved. Thank you. And then our director has now the floor. Thank you, Adela. Well, challenges, all of them. What's the goal? What's the objective to create an effective system to protect human rights? And the, uh, more, uh, the, the higher the number of rights that have been recognized Recognize the better and um, how the more efficient the instrument instrument we have, well, the better as well. Uh, the ambassador said um, it is room for improvement. And I remember that Helmut Schmidt, the German cancer, said that the largest room in the world was the room for improvement. So we need to, me to improve everything because what's at stake is of the utmost importance. So let me uh, go uh, straight to the point. The idea is for all states to take part in the Council. I think that uh, the country resolutions are, is a great, is an excellent idea because the uh, some countries are um, uh, committing massive human rights violations. But it's better that we all are all in because it's only if we're all together uh, that we can actually make progress. It's true that some countries' track record is much better than others, but uh, I mean, there's no room for uh, those with a higher level of protection. Uh, um, they cannot complain if they are criticized by others with a worse track record and vice versa. Because if we are all represented, the institution will get a higher profile and a greater, um, uh, a, a much, uh, a greater recognition. And that should be the objective of all of us who believe in human rights reforms. I believe that the debate on the reforms uh, is uh, making uh, steady progress. We need to be cautious, but we need to listen to everyone's proposals to make uh, a council as legitimate as possible and as efficient as possible. Some people are speaking about changing election processes, so uh, processes, uh, so countries, uh, countries selected have the better um, history in protection, protecting human rights, but maybe what we need is to change the existing rules. The presence of civil society, of course, it needs to be strengthened. We are speaking about um, uh, maintaining country resolutions. Of course, they are extremely useful. And we need to, to listen, um, to, to have our ears on the ground and see uh, the current, what the current trends are, uh, but uh, reform proposals, all of them need to be listened to because they, all of them are going to make a significant contribution to, to the country. It's true that uh, shortly after it was created, uh, the, uh, in 2006, there were already talks of reform, but it is an ongoing debate. It needs to be, uh, there needs to be a constant updating. We need to be very attentive to prevention, of course, prevention uh, viola of uh, human rights violations. Human rights violations sometimes are the cause and sometimes are the result of conflicts and sometimes both. And it is extremely important to be very mindful of this um, and uh, thinking about prevention. We need to improve communication between the Council and other bodies in the UN, mostly, in particular, the, the uh, uh, Security Council. Uh, violation of human rights is such a tragedy, such a drama for so many people, but it's also a factor and a driver of uh, instability, insecurity, and conflict. So, in our view, it should be 
dealt with by the uh, Security Council. And this is also subject to discussion. This is controversial because not everybody agrees on this, but we are making slowly but surely we're making progress. And um, I also agree with the idea that uh, there's a, a huge workload. It's true that I mean it's only it's only natural that we are ambitious because we want the system to work more and more efficiently. But it, there is an endless succession of proposals and uh, projects, resolutions. Uh, drafts and the council, it's uh, it's very limited. It's at its wit's end. Um, there is no there are no resources. There is no money to to uh, pursue everything. So even uh, maybe we should not take on board so many excellent initiatives, but initiatives, but only a few and and implement them better. So uh, being cautious and being prudent here, uh, that could be also a good instrument when trying to tackle the, the challenges ahead. Well, there are many different challenges. The, the, the work ahead is uh, huge, but uh, the international community is uh, fully supporting us, and I believe that in the next few years we will be able to, to reach excellent results. And, uh, well, we are not doing very well about time, but we still have one question, one question that we need to discuss because we are very interested to hear about this as future members of the Human Rights Council. So what I wanted to, to ask our uh, guests is what advice they would give us, what recommendations they would make to us as uh, members of the Council and members of the Bureau and uh, member states and representatives of uh, the uh, civil society. As from your three different uh, standpoints, what recommendations would you make to Spain as a um, incoming member. Um, I'd like to, to uh, ask you for three recommendations each, uh, those that you consider most essential. So we will start uh, with uh, uh, Ambassador Siskaras Veli, please. Well, thank you very much. Um, probably I'll be in this uh, segment very short. Uh, <coughs> uh, so first, uh, we've, uh, we've discussed a lot of uh, issues which are in the agenda. We've discussed a lot about the shortcomings we are facing in the Council, all of us here. Uh, we've discussed about the problems and the things we need to do in the Council. Uh, and, and I think um, in this, uh, in responding to this question, I, I'm probably uh, the wrong person to give uh, uh, recommendations to, uh, to a member state. Uh, I believe that uh, Spain has an extremely solid human rights uh, uh, agenda and background. It's a uh, well-recognized, uh, well-established multilateral player. So uh, I think uh, rather than giving some recommendations, which I'm not really entitled to do so to a member state, I would uh, very briefly say about the anticipation. And the anticipation of joining, from joining the Spain is that Spain is going to lead the processes there. We count on the leadership of Spain on, on all aspects uh, in the Council, on, on the challenges we, we face uh, there. Countries like Spain, together with with uh, with other partners, uh, other uh, partners, and other countries from different regions, with a solid human rights background, may lead the processes towards the right direction, and that is the anticipation. Personally, my anticipation of that, and I shouldn't, I, I don't really want to uh, to be considered that as a recommendation to a member state. That's my personal hope and feeling. Muchísimas gracias por sus amables palabras, embajador. Le doy la palabra al embajador Dudes. Esperamos de él oír si sí, alguna recomendación para nosotros. Shukran. En el hakika, atakden España, yani, mungkin atakdu ha, dola. 
قادرة على أن تقدم نصح أكثر من أن يتم نصحها فهي تسخر بتجربة give us recommendations. I mean, they can, they can give us some advice to us. They, they don't need to receive advice or recommendations from us, but the other way around. They are a well-established uh, democracy. We expect and anticipate from Spain that they are going to be excellent contributors. Uh, and are going to be helping all of us to, to solve the problems that we have in the Council and to overcome the obstacles and the hurdles that we have ahead of us. I believe that Spain can be uh, the bridge between the developing uh, countries and developed countries in the world. Uh, Spain can be a bridge between West, the West and uh, Western countries and all other representatives uh, of, of the countries all over the world. It's a difficult role. We, Mediterranean countries, I, I, I think that uh, it uh, falls upon our shoulders to, to play this role of uh, becoming uh, a bridge between different cultures because we were the cradle and still are um, a, a hub of diversity of cultures. We, Mediterranean countries, need to be flexible. We have been able. Uh, we have been able to do so in the past. We, uh, we. Uh, this is what Tunisia is uh, uh, trying to do to act as uh, as a bridge between different cultures and uh, um, ideas. We try to. We need to be reflective of all the experiences in matter of human rights, and I believe that we can be successful. There. The, this, uh, we, we need to, to act uh, to intensify our actions uh, in the protection of human rights. And I believe that Spain that has had an exemplary uh, democratic transition is a perfect uh, uh, example uh, in itself, uh, we would all love to, to be able to follow uh, whatever you have done. I think that everybody in the world could benefit and can benefit from your experience. And my third recommendation, I'll, I'll give it direct. I'll, I'll, I'll give it directly to the Spanish representative when the, when the, he uh, uh, comes to the council. I think that uh, I mean we we will be looking forward to cooperating with Spain in the Human Rights Council. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Ambassador, for your very kind words. We take very good note. Le damos ahora la palabra a Esteban Let me now give the floor to Esteban Beltran, Director of Amnesty International, to hear what recommendations civil society can uh, provide. Thanks again for this opportunity. We can talk about this more thoroughly at some other time, but let me give four uh, pieces of advice. First, sometimes countries' individual leadership is important. For instance, look at what happened at the Council with the Netherlands and uh, Yemen. That's an example of a country taking uh, individual leadership. So we would encourage that individual leadership. Spain as both ambassadors have, uh, have said, can uh, lead certain initiatives. So maybe um, Spain should work with Ireland to uh, respond to situations where human rights deteriorate. For instance, uh, the situation in Turkey, Egypt, the Philippines, Cambodia, I think those countries require action from the Human Rights Council before the situation deteriorates further. 
other topics uh, what, which um, Spain could promote because of its history, its tradition, the right to water, or the need to protect people defending uh, the environment, most of uh, human rights uh, defenders who are murdered uh, promote uh, and the environment. So this is important. So countries, topics, when it comes to reforms, I think that what matters is uh, to protect the current mandate that is in the resolution. I think that mandate is important. And how can it be protected from a civil society perspective? We hope the Spanish government will do that. And then we have uh, domestic issues, which Spain needs um, to take up, for instance, in 2019 or 2020. Spain will have to uh, undergo the universal uh, periodic review, and maybe Spain should ask itself, itself how it should implement the recommendations. Because um, a member of the council should also implement the recommendations made to it by the council. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we take note of uh, the, that advice. Let me now give the floor to our director. And in, for him, the question is what he thinks will be the commitments that Spain can take on as a member of the council starting in January. Thank you, Adela. Let me take up the comments that were just made. I'd like to thank the ambassadors from Georgia and Tunisia for their kind words on Spain. I agree, and I say this with modesty, in the area of human rights, all countries can improve, that's obvious, and so can we. But I do think Spain is a good pupil, a very good pupil. No one can question the fact that Spain is a uh, full democracy where uh, the rule of law prevails. We have the fewest uh, rulings against us by the European Court of, uh, human, on Human Rights. We've ratified practically all the conventions in the area of human rights. Defending human rights is one of our top foreign policy priorities. And Spain did everything it could to be elected to the Human Rights Council. In fact, very important countries uh, didn't make it into the council because um, the Spanish candidacy, which got the most votes, was very strong. So we're a good pupil, and if possible, we would like to serve the council well. Priorities, well, we could have 38 of them, but actually, we have to be reasonable, and we have to try to put forward the ones that uh, are most feasible. And we have several priorities. In the area of human rights for all, we have to fight all sorts uh, and types of discrimination. And I'd like to underscore discrimination suffered by people with disabilities. Spain has high standards in that area, and we will be promoting them. Another area, the rule of law and democracy. For Spain, combating the death penalty is crucial. I like to say that the International Commission on the Death Penalty is based in Spain. It's in our ministry. It has wonderful professionals that do a great job, uh, who travel abroad, who want more countries to abolish the death penalty, who want more countries to have a moratorium. And so Spain 
supports the fight against the death penalty wholeheartedly. And also, we want to defend people who defend human rights. We have a program to defend people who want to uphold human rights. We help people who have great difficulties in their countries and who have to flee, and they are welcomed here by the uh, Spanish government. And another area could be sustainable development. We've heard about human rights to water and sanitation. That's something that Spain is promoting with Germany, one year in New York and another year in Geneva. And we've been working on this successfully, upholding a fundamental right, the right of uh, water, which could be the subject of a, a massive conflict in the future. And then we have human rights and uh, corporations and companies. This is something which uh, is recent and uh, which is gaining traction. And we're going to be working on all of this through dialogue, dialogue on the council, dialogue with civil society who will come to the council to uh, s submit its proposals, and dialogue as well with special procedures. Spain opened up a, gave an, an open invitation, sent an open invitation to uh, these special procedure representatives so that they can come to our country at any time to see whatever they wish to see. We don't want to teach anybody lessons on the council. All we want to show is that Spain is a real democracy, that it has ideas, that it firmly believes in human rights. And what we want is uh, that uh, when we leave the Human Rights Council, just as we did a few months ago uh, with the um, Security Council, we hope that we will have contributed to defending human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think it's impossible to give the floor to the audience because uh, we are very much behind schedule. But since you are all invited to have a glass of uh, wine or anything you wish to have, I'll ask the speakers to be willing to keep up this interaction with the audience for a while so that we can continue this conversation very informally. I've been asked by Casa Arabe to make an announcement, and I think this is a very timely announcement. You should all know that on Wednesday uh, at 7 p.m., Casa Arabe will invite you to a conference called Democracy in Tunisia, Achievements and Challenges of the Transition. And I would now like to close this roundtable. I'd like to thank Casa Arabe for its hospitality and for the support of its team. And I would also like to very warmly thank all the speakers who've taken part in this roundtable and thank you all for being here. Thank you.